This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back, we're live, and here we are, fabulous, talking again uh, to Carlos Juarez. Carlos, is, uh, he left us uh, a year ago to go to Mexico, Mexico City, and uh, now we find that he's on a trip from Mexico City on a Fulbright uh, in Goa, Goa, India. Then he's a Fulbright, Fulbright Nehru scholar in BITS, we'll find out what that is in a minute, uh, in what, Pilana Goa campus in India. Carlos Suarez, uh, Global Connections Indeed. Welcome back, Carlos. We love to have you on the show. Well, thank you, Jay, and welcome. Welcome to our listeners and, of course, to all of you there. I'm really excited to reconnect and share with you some of my latest travels and travails. And here I am in Goa, India, on the other side of the planet. And actually, as we speak now, I'm actually calling you from the future because it's uh, Wednesday morning here and Thursday, uh, what, Tuesday <laughs> evening for you there in Hawaii. You are about as far away from Hawaii as, as any place on the planet, I must say. You can't get <laughs> further possible, than this. That's possible, right? <laughs> and that's why we're doing uh, Skype audio rather than Skype video because the connection's not, not exactly that good. But we are calling the show, if you don't mind, Carlos, Go, Go, Goa. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> well, tell us, how, you know, how it's been. Last time we knew you were in Mexico, Mexico City, uh, doing academic things there, living the good life. Uh, but now uh, you've moved on, um, at least for a while, to uh, your Fulbright in, in Goa. Tell us about it. Well, yes, Jay. Uh, as you uh, and some of our listeners may know, Go Fulbright is a program uh, sponsored by the U.S. government, and it works closely with most countries of the world, I think over 170, 180. And it's a, a program of international educational exchange. And so I'm here for the fall semester for about five, six months, uh, essentially uh, as a visiting professor uh, and the program known as the Fulbright Nehru program. Of course, Nehru being one of the founders of uh, modern India. And this coming week in a few more days, India will celebrate 70 years from its independence. So it's a big holiday here next uh, next week. And uh, I'm delighted to be part of this. It's a, effectively like a cultural ambassador. I'm, I'm here uh, helping to understand about this country, also teach about it. And so I'm, I'm affiliated with a university here in the, in the city of Goa. And we'll talk a little bit about Goa because it's a fascinating place, actually shares a lot of interesting uh, things with Hawaii, given the, the Portuguese legacy here, but also the connection there in Hawaii. Well, where is it exactly? Can you give us a sort of a geographical uh... Uh, positioning on where it is in India? Yes, of course. And if, you know, we, we think of India, you know, it's somewhat shaped like a cone, like an ice cream cone. And uh, this would be on the west coast, uh, about halfway in the middle, roughly. Uh, it is considered South India because India is a very large country and a good part of it, you know, goes into the northern part. So it is on the west coast, the Arabian Sea. Uh, it's a large port city. And uh, for about 450 years, that was part of the Portuguese empire, an overseas empire, uh, and this was their main headquarters in the South Asia subcontinent. So today, Goa is a very small state, uh, the smallest state of India, just uh, under 2 million people, uh, and it only joined the, the country of India in 1961. So after India was independent in 47, it took over a decade of negotiations for the Portuguese to finally let it go. and. And so here it is today, a small, uh, popular destination for tourism, uh, famous for its beaches, for a, a very relaxed lifestyle. It, it shares a lot of that, uh, what Hawaii has, that uh, very easygoing lifestyle. You know, uh, Carlos, I was in Portugal, <clears throat> in Lisbon, uh, not quite a year ago. And, um, they, you know, they're, they're very proud of their explorations around the world. They're very proud mm -hmm. of Goa. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we think of, well, today we, we know Portugal to be a relatively small European country. It's not, you know, one of the heavy players. Even neighboring Spain is a larger country by any measure. But Portugal in the 17th, 16th century was a pretty significant overseas empire uh, in parts of Africa, Asia, uh, you know, and uh, and of course here uh, in this place of Goa was their, their headquarters for this region. Uh, and they do have, in fact, a large community of Goans who live back in Portugal today. And the legacy is here. I mean, after 450 years, it's hard to, to not have it. Yeah. However, one thing that's interesting is while Portuguese was spoken here 
during much of that time. Today, you only find it spoken among the very older generation. Uh, most of the, not now it's more than 50 years since they're independent, uh, and so you don't have too much spoken here. However, the legacy is very real in terms of architecture, in terms of the cuisine, uh, and I've had a chance to send some photos just to give a snapshot of yeah, some, why don't you call some of them out and we'll play the some of the photos. region of India, you've got this Portuguese architecture that looks like it's frozen in time. Uh, a number of different, you know, buildings and, and mansions and homes and churches. Um, you know, India is a overwhelmingly Hindu population, but here in the state of Goa, about 30% of the population is, in fact, Christian, uh, Catholic. Interesting. So uh, it's a pretty significant part of the population here locally. Well, let's, let's look at some of those photos. You sent them along. Uh, here's one. It, it, looks like, it looks like tiles. It looks like a house yeah, built of big tiles. What is all that this about? Is a, 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 you know, in the city of Panjim, which is the main, uh, the main city of Goa, uh, what you have here is a, a very beautiful, impressive. I mean, it's like a massive style tiles. I mean, it, 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 you'll see uh, evidence of the Portuguese, and, and this would be one very interesting example. Uh, but beyond that, uh, you have, again, a number of mansions that uh, reflect the, and just even the most typical homes that are now, uh, you know, because of the tropical environment, they get a lot of, you know, worn down and lots of mold and then, you know, these plants everywhere. So it, it's a very exotic look. Yeah. Uh, but quite fascinating. When we were in uh, Portugal, we saw houses like this and we saw tiles yes. like this everywhere. It's an art form in Portugal as, as a, a unique art form. You don't find it anywhere else. And so, well, I suppose you find it in, in various forms in else other places, but in Portugal, it's very distinct. And so this is very That's Portuguese, right. this design of this house. What else have we got in the photos? Um, you know, another aspect is what, what's fascinating is the syncretism or the blending of, of essentially, let's say, Catholic uh, uh, architecture or churches together with Hindu. So you'll have Hindu temples, and there's one of them in there that uh, is an example where it actually has, a, again, a more of the Catholic uh, look uh, in terms of the, the style, but it is in fact a Hindu temple. Uh, and, uh, and so it is the syncretism that you see throughout and even to the extent that people here will celebrate the holidays. Uh, the Catholics will celebrate Hindu traditions and vice versa, uh, and even uh, a Muslim community here. And so there's just a very interesting laboratory of how these three major religions come together here in, in, in celebration. Now these are, this is a very nice temple uh, I really like the architecture. It's got a very sturdy look to it, and it doesn't yes. look that old. Can you date it for us? Um, let's see. I don't have it in before me here, but much of this will tend to be from the 17th and 18th century. Um, the Portuguese first arrived in, in 1510, actually 1498. I'm sorry, 1498. Vasco da Gama is the first explorer who comes here. But in 1510, they they formally be, make it part of their empire and and in Goa specifically, and so, you know, after 450 years, but much of the construction would begin in the, the 17th century and into the 18th century, but again, the style would remain, so even buildings done in the last 50, 100 years would all maintain this, uh, this fascinating architectural style. You mentioned Vasco da Gama. Uh, he is the biggest hero in Portugal. There are a lot of heroes yes. in Portugal, but he is the biggest Indeed. one. Indeed, and, and it is the name of the port city here that is kind of like a, a little more of an industrial, uh, pretty rough part of town, but it's a, it's a big port city and a port of call for some cruise ships, uh, and it's the closest town here to me where I am. Uh, and just to mention, you had uh, cited my affiliation here. I'm actually a visiting professor here at, a, at an engineering school, a science and technology school. It's called the Birla, B-I-R-L-A, the Birla Institute of Technology and Science, or it's an abbreviation BITS. And this is uh, one of their four campuses. They have uh, the main campuses uh, closer to Delhi. They have another one in Hyderabad and uh, a fourth campus in Dubai. Uh, and so this campus in Goa is, is a, one of their you know, top uh, engineering schools in India. And I have the opportunity here as a social scientist to, to teach uh, these future leaders of India. These are you know, engineering and science students. Quite a fascinating experience for me as well. Uh, how, you must be related to Mr. Fulbright. <laughs> it is. Uh, I, I must say, you know, these are uh, very rare and competitive awards. I've been very fortunate to have now my fourth one. Uh, initially from uh, from Hawaii, I uh, was at HBU and I went to Mexico back in the year 2000. 
And then I had two grants to the Czech Republic, uh, 2003 and 2005. And you'll recall a little over two years ago, two and a half years ago, I was in Austria. And that was another Fulbright grant. Uh, so this is uh, yet one more. Uh, I can't say I'm related, but uh, I, maybe I, I have a good understanding of one of the, <laughs> one of the important roles of Fulbright. Is it's not just a boondoggle to come and study, but you really do need to try to help uh, connect uh, and, and build bridges and, and have sort of long-term outcomes. Uh, so my goal here, aside from teaching, is to really develop some collaboration, some links, and to help them understand and make sense of our country. And this is, of course, an interesting time to do that because uh, Indians are very curious and they have a lot of opinions about uh, what's happening in the world and no doubt what's happening in the U.S. as well. Yeah, well, you know, but I think it goes to a point we talked about briefly before the show, and that is the travel is education. And you can't be fully educated without travel. And maybe Americans don't travel enough because once you get out there, you, you have you be able to see the way the country looks from the outside in. But that gives you another viewpoint that you really need to have, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, you can learn a lot from reading and even, you know, even the fact is you don't have to see the world. It'll come to you, right? Anywhere you go, you know, the world is, you know, basically staring at you and coming to you. But there is no substitute to going out, living, experiencing, learning the local cultures, you know, eating the food and, and, and smelling the flowers because uh, that, that really immerses you and it forces you to think differently. Uh, again, you, you put yourself out of your comfort zone but you also both appreciate how things are done elsewhere and you've come to you know, gain respect and admiration because everywhere you go, people, people are doing things and sometimes they do it like you, sometimes they do it differently and you can't help but, but ask questions and, and be fascinated by that. And I think ultimately, I, so we talked a moment about the syncretism, this mixture, that's what you, you get fascinated by here because it blends the European culture that was brought here with the local indigenous cultures and, and so today it has created a very unique place here in Goa. And, you know, there are a lot of other pockets like that. But this one in particular really is quite an interesting mixture of, of yes. these major cultures. It's the religion. vitality of diversity, which we know is the most important thing for good thinking and globalism. Let's take a short break, uh, Carlos. We take a one minute yes. break. And I want to call Congress and uh, tell them that they ought to think in terms of diversity, diversity also and that they should do more traveling. We'll be, we'll be back right after that, one minute, with Carlos Suarez. He joins us by Skype, Skype audio from Goa, India. We'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. We have this crazy thing going on today. I was just walking by and all these DJs and producers are set up all around the city. I just walked by and I said, what's happening guys? They told me they were making music. There were a lot of people that claimed they had no musical talent and then sat down and kind of played some really nice sounds. So we do it. We're back. We're, we're live with Carlos Suarez, who, an old friend who uh, joins us by Skype audio from Goa, India. He's there on a Fulbright. Uh, he, it's the Fulbright uh, Nehru. Um, let's see, Fulbright Nehru Scholar. Scholar. Scholarship program at BITS in Pilani, uh, Goa, Goa campus, uh, India. And uh, we are so happy to talk to him. But Carlos, uh, you know, one of the things that's really valuable is uh, your way, and you've done this in, in other places through Phil, Fulbrights and otherwise, um, to engage with people and to learn the essence of the place and the people, you know, where, where you are. And we've talked to you in some of those places uh, from Europe uh, a year or two ago, and I've always enjoyed our conversations. And now we have a, a sort of fresh fresh asset here in terms of dealing with uh, the people in Goa. So tell us about, about them. Tell us about your interaction with them. 
Um, you mentioned that they were curious in all this. Are they like the Indians in Bangalore, you know, heavily involved in tech, or is it something else? Well, this, as I said earlier, this is a technology school, a science and engineering place. And I was a, a little bit uh, flabbergasted to say that uh, when I, I have a class right now with about 60, 65 students, and actually it turns out not a single one of them is from Goa. I was a little disappointed, to be honest. <laughs> but what it is, this is a very elite competitive school. You know, the admissions are very rigorous. And so the students come from all parts of India, which I think itself is a, an interesting laboratory because they come here and they meet people from places that they've never been to. India is a massive country, 1.3 billion, so uh, you can imagine uh, uh, just the diversity itself. But at any rate, what these students do share in common, as, as these are gifted, you know, educated young leaders, uh, they have a pretty good understanding of global issues. I'm, I'm really impressed, and, and that's part of what I'm here to also research about. What, what is it that's allowing them to learn so much about the world? Well, of course, they grow up with technology that gives them clear links, but uh, as well, the kind of mobility that, frankly, their parents and grandparents simply didn't have. And, and this is true everywhere today. But, you know, India has a huge diaspora community. Indians, you know, who are people of Indian origin who live especially in the UK and all over parts of the United States. Uh, and interesting that that community is now more and more connected back here. So many of these will have relatives or, or family who have lived in the US or the UK and now come back. But these students, they have a, even though they're studying, you know, chemical engineering or computer science, I'm impressed that they have a pretty good understanding of what's happening in the world. And, uh, you know, they, they read voraciously, they ask questions. Uh, I think uh, it's fair to say, especially, again, we're talking about these elites. They're, these are not the average Indian, but they really get a very solid uh, education that forces them to, to think critically about the world. I think uh, from the perspective of the United States, uh, it's a, a little worrying because these are people who are going to be, at the end of the day, eating our lunch, so to speak. They're going to be <laughs> making decisions that are going to impact us. But they have a pretty good understanding of it, a different perspective, of course, from where they sit, but uh, a very deep knowledge of what's happening in the world. So at any given day, they, they're asking me questions about what's happening with the, you know, the, the Trump investigations or what is happening about North Korea. And these are students of science that traditionally you wouldn't expect them to be thinking about global social political issues. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. I just came back from a trip uh, in the Inner Passage on a, on a cruise ship in, in Alaska. And a Norwegian yeah. flag, it was a Norwegian sun, the ship. Uh, and the Indians were well represented on the ship. They were well represented in the, in, among the passengers. There were at least a plurality there. And they were well represented among the crew. And it goes to your point about how they like to travel and learn about, you know, places far away, how they like to be global in their thinking. And it was indeed, they were true. They were, they were that was true for them. And they were a, a substantial part of the, of the social structure of the ship. And so, um, you know, I think that India has a, a great future going forward. And the question I put to you is, how do they feel about their future? Do you see them traveling more? Do you see them getting involved in enterprises that are global rather than just Indian? Uh, do you see them making, you know, making enterprises that are uh, profitable around the world? Well, I mean, yes and yes. I mean, I want to say that what I'm fascinated is that while they have, I think, uh, this, this global connection, if you will, uh, through uh, you know, the communities that are all around the world and just their own education here, what I'm also, I think, impressed with is there is a very strong social conscience, if you will, and maybe a, a, a put it a different way, there's a deep appreciation of their culture and, and how important it is for them to maintain that. So while they are well you know, westernized in some level and deeply connected to the world, at their core, they have a sense of identity of what what culture they come from. And while it is India, and there's a sense of that as a national pride, it's even deeper than that. It's more, you know, what part of India or what, you know, what culture sure. within India. So it's these multiple identities that they hold and that they can walk these different circles, whether it's on a cruise boat in, uh, in Alaska or, you know, a high-tech uh, company in, in the Silicon Valley. Uh, they are able to walk these many circles of, 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 of you know, of the world, uh, it really is impressive. And, you know, it speaks to the deep links that this part of the world has had for centuries now. And now they're doing it on their terms, which is, I think, even more fascinating. Yeah, and Goa was probably part of that, to connect them with uh, Europe. And so, 
Um, I just That's I right. wonder also, um, uh, you know, how how they feel about their own government. You talked about their sort of sense of self-identity. Um, how do they feel about Mr. Modi, Narendra Modi? Um, are they happy with him? Is that contentious? I, he's made some he's made some good moves and maybe some bad moves. Uh, what's the sense of the people? Well, uh, you know, I, I, I was speaking precisely about that just the other day, and, and I, I want to say, on one hand, I think there is a general sense of pride, and I speak to whether it's the taxi driver or, or the you know the educated college student, they are um, aware that this leader that they have at the moment, the Prime Minister Narendra Modi, he is moving forward with a lot of dynamism, a lot of strategic uh, thinking. He is trying to put India first in their own way. And I think there's a sense of admiration for that because he is a pretty dynamic leader relative to other recent ones. Now, does he have controversy? Of course. And there will be some who, who might look at his autocratic tendencies or, or maybe they're more critical of his pretty strong Hindu nationalism. But I want to say, by and large, my feeling is that there is a sense of pride about him. Um, you know, and even a, an, a, an understanding that while he may share some uh, an authoritarian tendencies with, with our current president, th there's a world of difference in terms of just the, the sheer competence and maybe level of uh, sophistication that th this guy, he's doing it in their own, let's say, you know, Hindu nationalist way. But I see a sense of pride among them. And, and as I said earlier, they're about to celebrate Independence Day. And there seems to be a resurgence of nationalism. And as I teach the students, you know, over and over, nationalism can be a very good thing, of course, for unity and, and, and pride. Of course, it can also be a double-edged sword. It can be the kind of thing that pushes violence and, and, and often leads us to some uglier aspects. So they need to be aware of that. I think they are. But overall, my sense is that Modi is seen with considerable pride and, and, and relatively positive that he's really trying to do things to improve the country. Yeah, great. Now, what about, uh, you know, their neighbors? Uh, they have, you know, to the, to the northwest, uh, they have Pakistan, which is on the border of, uh, gee whiz, Afghanistan and all the trouble in Iran. Um, uh, how do they feel about that? Is that a threat? I mean, after all, we had an attack in Mumbai a few years ago. Um, is, there a, is there worrying about terrorism? Is there worrying about a spillover of, uh, of violence uh, from the Middle East and Central Asia? Well, my, my short answer would be not quite, not, not what you see, let's say, in Europe, where it's a very real uh, you know, reality if you're traveling in Paris or Belgium or, or uh, you know, London. But um, nevertheless, there is an awareness that there are tensions in the neighborhood. Yes, uh, China is the tr other traditional rival, and there are some, as we speak now in the last few weeks, uh, a bit of tension up in the border area with China. Um, and China has most recently bought out some uh, large port facilities in neighboring Sri Lanka. And, and while the Chinese argue it's all about their commercial interests, of course, India sees it as, you know, really they're getting a foothold just a stone's throw away. Uh, and then there's Pakistan, the perennial, you know, tension uh, at the border. And yet I see Pakistan is a very complex issue because, you know, the partition now literally 70 years ago um, also divided so many families. So there are many here who still have those links, uh, perhaps now several generations old, but no doubt the neighborhood is tense. However, I want to say people's daily lives here, and, and there's not a sense of, you know, fear or insecurity. Uh, they're not living as if, you know, this is a place that's going to be attacked. Uh, you mentioned the Mumbai uh, attacks. I think it was about some six, seven years ago, quite dramatic, no doubt. Uh, but uh, by and large, that was an aberration, an exception. We where you have violence, it tends to be more localized and really between very hardline uh, Hindu nationalists, often taking on uh, uh, some Muslim communities. And the other violence, which has also surprised me, is uh, because of the Muslim, I'm sorry, not Muslim, the Hindu ban on, on beef, there's been a bit of violence about those who either manufacture or, or sell and market uh, beef. And, and, and so they've been attacked by some uh, hardline nationalist uh, and uh, beyond that, no, I want to say in general, the place is focused more on just local, regional issues and yet aware that the world out there is a pretty dangerous place in yeah. certain parts of the world. Well, you know, uh, uh, Thomas Friedman recently wrote a book uh, or released, uh, published a book uh, called uh, Thanks for Being Late, in which he covers uh, his view of various uh, continents and um, geopolitical issues around the world. And uh, he covers the migrant issue, of course. I mean, it has to be covered these days. And so you have one third of all the migrants coming to Europe, coming from the Middle East. You have two thirds of them 
uh, coming from Africa, uh, sub-Saharan Africa. But what's interesting is uh, the migrants are, are not coming to India. Are people worried about that? Or is, there, or is there an effort, some kind of initiative to try to prevent them or possibly incentivize them to come to? What, what is the government's position on that? Well, I, I haven't looked at it in detail, but my quick gut feeling is that it, it's not so much an issue. This is a place that is, has abundant labor. There's just you know, a lot of people and they don't have the need that you see in many of the parts, let's say, of Europe and even the U.S., where there's an important pull for migrant workers. So it, this doesn't exist here. There are, of course, migrants, yes, uh, and, and many of these port cities have had a tradition of that. If anything, what I think is happening is more of a, a return migration of those Indians who had left and, and gone a generation ago. If you moved to, you know, to London, you, you made it a permanent move. Now you can go for studies and come back and have job opportunities here so there's a growing sort of capital, uh, we would call it like a, a reverse brain drain, where many who have had experience in the West are now seeing opportunities to live and, and to maintain your culture and live at home and, 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 and work here and still be connected to the global economy. So I would be remiss if I didn't ask you how, of, how of you the are. The uh, community itself, not really large numbers. And yet this place has a history of migrants who came, whether it was from the Middle East itself, uh, even parts of Africa. Uh, but especially from you know Europe uh, through uh, the period of colonial rule, uh, but not a not an issue of African migrants really. Uh, instead, I think what you have are huge communities of Indians who live in the Middle East, for example. Uh, this university I might has its own campus in Dubai, and uh, mainly it's focused to reach out to the Indian community that's there. Uh, and so, just a good example of the the connections that they have with their own communities abroad. Well, let me ask you what they think about, uh, and you alluded to this a minute ago, about Trump and about American politics and uh, the shenanigans in, in Congress. Um, and for that matter, the relationship of the public and the government in the U.S., um, because it's in transition, and some say even transformation. Uh, are the Indians thinking about that? Are these students aware of, of the fine points of that? Are they, do they have any views that they've expressed to you? Well, yes, and, and for the most part, and these are the more outspoken ones in class that are discussing it, what they see, I think, and it comes from popular media, from the news, whether it's fake or real, and that is that there's a deep, uh, you know, divide in the U.S. and that there are some real, very real social challenges and issues, whether it's the opioid crisis or, you know, the plight of, especially issues like the plight for African Americans and how it is a, a very, you know, different world than, than it might be for others. So they are aware of these kind of social tensions and conflicts. Uh, and indeed, I would say they highlight them in a way that kind of is very critical. Uh, I've had other experiences coming here in India, and in general, they're very, very political animals. They like to challenge you. They like to you know, push you against the wall, and uh, they don't hesitate about that. And so many of the views I hear tend to be about this, this perspective, rather critical of, of U.S. Uh, uh, society, that you know we are not this beacon on the hill. And I think that's where some of the danger lies that we've seen this erosion of, you know, what does the U.S. stand for? I mean, for much of the world, it has always been a place where, you know, you can bring your tired and hungry and, you know, the immigrant story. Today, that's probably coming under more question about, you know, well, wait a minute, look, look at how, you know, m migrants are being treated or look at how minorities suffer from yeah. discrimination. So I think there's a keen awareness of that here. Yes. Well, you know, you, you mentioned uh, China, and of course, China is always, um, you know, trying to expand its influence, uh, including, uh, with, you know, with soft power maneuvers uh, in various countries in and around uh, India. And I wonder how people feel about China vis-a-vis -vis the United States, especially in the time of Trump. Um, no. You know, are they still uh, our best buddy? Uh, do they still see the U.S. as their better friend, better, better friend than China? How do you feel about that? How do they feel about that? My, my gut feeling is that th there's a distinction between what would be called maybe the U.S. government and maybe the current administration. Obviously, there's a, there's a positive bewilderment, there's confusion about it, there's a sense that right now uh, it may not be uh, clear what, what that relationship should be. And maybe different from, you know, those who have had opportunities, you know, to travel and study. I mean, the U.S. will always be a place that attracts the best and brightest to come to our universities, et cetera. But uh, in terms of the government-to-government -government relations, those are, at the moment, a bit mixed. Uh, there was a lot of hope uh, 
I, I, maybe I wouldn't say hope, but maybe an early expectation that the two leaders coming together, Modi and Trump, you know, would be able to foster cooperation. And, and on some level it is there, but my sense is that there's a little bit of an awareness that, that you, you can't be sure what's going to happen. And what that means, I think, is that India, just like today is happening in a place like Mexico and other parts of the world, they're looking elsewhere. They're looking to realize that maybe the U.S. at the moment, uh, you know, looking inward, is not going to be the place that's going to help solve all our problems. And so I think for India, much like China, it's, a, it's an opportunity for them to put their energy in other areas. And there is a very mixed love-hate relationship with China because while there are tensions and there are competition, there's also a growing connection of cooperation. And China is taking the lead, but it is uh, developing this very ambitious project to connect much of this world and develop infrastructure specifically. Uh, and part of that connects with India as well. So it's a real mixed bag, but I think India sees the, the troubles and travails in the U.S. as an opportunity uh, to look elsewhere. Well, well, uh, you know, it's, uh, Carlos, it seems to me that you're more than an academic these days. Um, in the circumstances, you're more than a scholar, more than a Fulbright scholar, more than a teacher, more, more than a, a person who exchanges with the local students. You, you are a citizen diplomat. That's what you are. You represent the United States, even though you're spending your time in Mexico. And uh, well, thank, you know, do, you, do you, you see Jay. it that way? I think, uh, let me add to that, that I think what you're doing with these type of shows over the years now is you're helping to, to really connect us all in a way that brings the world closer uh, and, and underscores how, how deeply connected all of us are, regardless of where we are in the world. Amen to that. Feel very close to you, even though you're a half a world away in Goa. Thank you so much, Carlos. It's been wonderful to talk to you. I hope we can do it again soon. Yes, of course, Jay, and thank you and all your listeners, and I will make it back to Hawaii soon enough to, to visit you there again in person. Aloha. Thanks so much. Al Aloha.